Welcome into the 217th episode of the Young Terps podcast from the Viner Fordgate studio. This is your host, Mason Viner, and today a packed show as, well, the crazy time of the year carries on where we have football, both basketballs going on at once, plus a couple pushes for some championships, and we'll start, I guess, at the high point of this show and bring in my man, Todd Carton. And Todd, uh, we got a Terps team heading off to the Final Four. Yes, we do, and uh, I think that's probably the high point. Not me being on the show, but I appreciate that introduction, Mason. Uh, yeah, you know, I mean, Maryland went into the NCAA tournament coming off of a loss in the semifinal of the Big Ten uh, tournament, and uh, they started last week on Friday with a 2-1 to one double overtime exciting win. They certainly, Maryland field hockey didn't make this weekend easy on themselves. They got a double overtime win over Liberty. Uh, they had beaten Maryland in the national semifinal last year, three to two in double overtime. Yeah. And then um, the Terps, you know, went into Sunday with a shot at the final four with the Syracuse orange uh, in front of them, Todd. And well, for a second, it looked like they were going to get away with it with the two second half goals, but Syracuse uh, responds late in that one and sends it into uh, a handful of overtimes. Yeah, you know, it was another double overtime thriller. Uh, actually went beyond double overtime because uh, although the Terps took a lead on a late goal in the fourth quarter um, with uh, Sophie Klautz, a freshman, put the Terps ahead with about five minutes to go. Syracuse came back, tied the, the score about a minute later, and then they went through both overtimes without scoring. So it went into... And Mason, I'm not making this up. The uh, series that they call in field hockey a stroke off. Yeah, I don't think um, should have told our younger audience to cover their ears before you said that one, Todd. Yeah, I probably I probably should have, <laughs> but maybe the younger audience won't exactly get the potential double entendre there. Um, and and that was pretty astonishing. You know, one of the things that Missy Maharg does has done for this year is she has taken a goalie, Paige Keft, and she has designated her as the goalie who will face either penalty strokes or the strokes in the shootout, stroke-offs type situation. But she hadn't played for a couple of games. She had to come in off the bench cold, and she didn't get off to the best of, of starts, as uh, you might want to tell folks. No, it wasn't the best uh, start for the Terps, who gave up two early penalty shots on that. and But they fired back, and they finished it off with a big save, Todd. Yeah, I mean, that was it was pretty astonishing because um, it came down to the fact that with Syracuse jumping out two to nothing, it's a best of five series. And so it came down to a point where if Syracuse had scored beyond that, then Maryland had no margin for error. Maryland had, would have had to score on their final three shots. As it turned out, Maryland scored on two of their final three. So the shoot, the stroke off went to a sixth round. Maryland led off with Hope Rose getting the ball by Syracuse's goalie, and then Paige kept made a phenomenal save. It's I mean, you can probably find it on Twitter, um, and folks should watch it because it's a pretty remarkable save against one of the best players in the country, a four-time All-American, uh, Charlotte DeVries. Yeah, and those stroke-off scenarios kind of go into, it's almost like man-on-man -man basketball defense from what I saw from Keft uh, on her final save. She comes out, you know, a good three, four yards out of the goal mouth and just kind of boxes out. Uh, the Syracuse player, and then just manages to slide her feet in front and make the save. And make a kick save. Yeah, it was a, it was a pretty remarkable thing. And, you know, I mean, this this has been, a, a except for the way North Carolina has, who was the top overall seed and comes into the semis undefeated, except for the way that they have sort of dominated their opponents, this has been quite a competitive uh, NCAA tournament. Maryland will play Northwestern in sort of, I guess we'll call it the rubber match of the series because they'd split the two previous meetings. Well, Northwestern won their mat game uh, quarterfinal game in a shootout, beating Iowa four to three. But they had also won their previous, their first game in a shootout over Miami of Ohio. 
So that's been close. Michigan, which went in as the number one seed, lost in overtime. It's been a very, very exciting tournament. And we go on to stores. So there are four teams left, three of them from the Big Ten, with uh, North Carolina will face off against uh, Penn State in the first game Friday. And uh, and that game will be at noon. The Terps uh, will play Northwestern at three in stores. Those games will be on ESPN plus not big 10 plus yeah todd and what an impressive tournament for the big 10 teams three of the five that make the tournament reached the final four you mentioned it northwestern beat iowa so that was a guaranteed big 10 uh entrance into the final four the terps get it done and hey i think we've uh seen a couple of uh, big wins in stores from another program and on campus um well not stores program? but hartford you know UConn <laughs> hosts maryland wins <laughs> yeah, we have. We have indeed uh, some Maryland basketball wins, I guess. And, um, you know, so that's always exciting. And and a, and a um, lacrosse win, I guess, in Hartford. They had a small win, couple of wins in Hartford earlier this year, did they not? Well, well that's what I was going for. Completely forgot. Because, <laughs> you know, it's, it's UConn's home field that just happens to be in Hartford. Is this in? This is actually in stores? This is actually in stores, yeah. So the Terps... Uh... I guess last game of the season against UConn pays off uh, as they get to go back up there to play the Final Four, which is one of the reasons why they schedule it. Uh, Todd, let's talk about our other team that's heading on to the NCAA tournament, which is our Terps men's soccer team. They lose a 2-1 heartbreaker to Indiana this week in the Big Ten tournament at home. And, um, well, Indiana, did Indiana end up winning the Big Ten or did Rutgers win it? No, actually, Rutgers got the AQ, although Indiana wound up with the only, as the only seeded team out of the conference. But Rutgers handled them pretty easily Sunday, beat them 3-1 to one at uh, in Piscataway. And it's the first men's championship of any kind for any Rutgers team since joining the Big Ten. Uh, Maryland only has 46 more than they do. Yeah, just a, just a handful more, but the Terps... Uh, against Indiana, they cut that lead. They started off the game, and it was not very pretty. They give up uh, two goals in the first half. They cut the lead in half in the 61st minute. And then Todd, uh, I was watching, and it was just um, frustrating. Chance after chance for the Terps. They hit the crossbar two or three times uh, down the stretch. They get a red card, which was actually a combination of two yellow cards against Dylan Griffin. And... Uh, Joshua Bulma almost got it done again, but he hits the crossbar uh, the final time for the Terps, which ended their Big Ten tournament run. And uh, today at 1 o'clock, we saw the uh, tournament brackets come out. The Terps not seeded despite where they ranked number eight going into the Big Ten tournament, but they don't end up with a seed. I, th- I, I think they were you know, they were certainly in the top ten in the last coaches poll. But as, I, as I've told folks for for I think I feel like forever – just don't pay attention to the coaches' polls because the uh, NCAA seeding committee pays very little attention to those polls. They they look at strength of schedule. They look at how our team's playing at the end of the year. All sorts of combinations of things. And and um, you know I I think if Maryland had been the team that had at least won the semifinal and hosted, even if they had lost ultimately to Rutgers, Maryland would have been the seeded team out of the Big Ten. Of course, the ACC got eight teams in the 48-team field and has four of them as top 16 seeds, so uh, two seeds out of the Pac-12 as well. Yeah, no, so three the, seeds. I'm sorry, three out of the Pac-12. And Maryland will move forward. They will still host a NCAA tournament game. Todd, who do they have? They will play fairly Dickinson sometime on Thursday as we're recording this at a little after 2 in the afternoon Monday uh, I have not seen a time announced yet for that game. It's still listed on the NCAA site as uh, TBA, so we'll know that. But folks can check in, I'm sure, either on NCAA.com or the UM Terp site as soon as that becomes available. Uh, we'll see that. And then if Maryland wins, uh, they'll make a trip to Cornell, most likely, who came in as the number 14 overall seed. So Maryland's pursuit for and another NCAA soccer championship starts this Thursday at Ludwig Field. They'll take on Fairleigh Dickinson, and we'll have the coverage of that game next week on the Non-Rev Report. Todd, 
Uh, let's get over to one of the sports we usually start off with, volleyball. And we mentioned that would be a br brutal stretch for the Terps on the court. And, well, they don't win a set over the weekend. Yeah, uh, not terribly surprising. They traveled out to Minnesota and Wisconsin. Minnesota started the weekend ranked ninth. Wisconsin uh, started the weekend ranked third in the country. And they played them on back-to-back -back days. Um, really, really, uh, the Maryland didn't even compete, to tell you the truth, against Minnesota. They were more competitive against Wisconsin. And it was interesting in that their starting setter was out with an illness. So they had to switch the way they play completely. Um, but And they were a little competitive, but both sets were were pretty well um, handled by without any real stress on the home teams. And so Maryland fell to 5-11 and 11 in, in conference and 14-14 and 14 overall. And then they're going to host Ohio State Friday night. Um, and Ohio State's coming off a big win over Nebraska. So it looks like that the Big Ten championship is going to come down to Ohio State or Wisconsin now because they both have each have one, only one loss and Nebraska now has two conference losses. Yeah, and the disappointing season rolls on for the Terps who are now 5-11 and 11 in conference. Todd, uh, Michigan on Saturday, do you think uh, the Terps maybe pick up another win in conference over um, the weekend? You know... If you if you look at uh, the the level of play, if the Terps are going to pick up a win this weekend, uh, Michigan is the one that they they have a better chance in. Uh, then they'll finish out the season hosting Purdue and traveling to Indiana, and so that Indiana is a possible win for the Terps. I mean, they could wind up again with seven, which is, I think where they finished up last year. But given some of the chances they had early in the season, I, I think that this year qualifies as a bit of a disappointment. Yeah, both of those games can be seen on Big Ten+. Plus. Todd, let's head uh, yeah. down the hallway at Xfinity over to women's basketball. Yeah, women's basketball. Well, they started last week with a win over at, on the road at George Mason, and it was a win in which uh, Diamond Miller kind of tweaked a knee injury that she's faced on um, for the last year, year and a half. And they lost Emma Chardon for the season who tore her, uh, has a torn meniscus. Uh, the Terps came out of that one with a win and then had to face the defending national champion, South Carolina, Friday night uh, at Xfinity Center. Then a game that was broadcast nationally on ESPN started at six o'clock. And the Terps were played admirably for the first half uh, trailing only by six at the break, but after that, it was pretty much a dominant dominant performance by the Gamecocks, and, or as I like to call them, the Game Hens. Uh, their size just overwhelmed Maryland. Maryland just didn't have the, the size or the consistency to, um, to challenge them. Yeah, the South Carolina. Without Diamond Miller. Yeah, South Carolina leads the rebounding margin plus 23 at the end of the game. And just too much experience, too much size from South Carolina. Uh, the Terps bounced back on Sunday with uh, a bit of a nail biter against Fordham, eighty-three to seventy-six. Maryland takes it. Yeah, and actually, uh, Fordham actually crept into a lead late in the third quarter in that game. I think they were up uh, fifty-nine, fifty-eight, and the Terps tied tied the score on a free throw and then a late. Uh, three-pointer in the third quarter let Maryland take a 62-59 lead into the fourth but the Maryland was really never able to put them away uh, throughout the, the game uh, they they ran out a couple of times to uh, 12 or 14 point leads and then allowed Fordham who was jacking up threes which is what the mid-majors will do against the high majors and they they made a fair amount they should made 12 out of 36 and that kept them in that kept them in the game. Plus, uh, Maryland had about 17 turnovers. And again, Maryland actually struggled on the boards against an undersized uh, Fordham team. Fordham had 17 offensive rebounds that led to uh, 15 second chance points. Yeah, and the Terps uh, bailed out in many ways by Diamond Miller, who they were missing uh, on Friday. She puts up a career high in rebounds in the game. And, Todd, it just seems like Diamond Miller is just that star for Brenda Freeze on the basketball court this year. 
Yeah, it, it, I think that the team comes down, uh, you know, I look, it's a very revamped roster. They're, they're looking to find their identity and their chemistry and, you know, figure out where everybody's going to be, when they're going to be there. And until that happens, unless and until that happens, it's going to come down to Diamond Miller and Abby Myers are going to have to carry that team. A against South Carolina, I think Abby Myers had pretty close to half of Maryland's points in the first half. And without Miller on the court, she just kind of wore down some in the second half and, and South Carolina's length and, and physicality took over uh, for that. I, I don't think Maryland would have beaten South Carolina instead of losing by 25, maybe they'd have lost by 15 had they had Miller that night. But it's a good learning experience and we'll see. The Terps will have a game uh, coming up, I think, uh, next week against Baylor, who's another top-ranked foe. Yeah, they certainly stack the schedule, Brenda does, so they'll have their fair shots uh, at the top 10 this year. And Todd wrapping, wrapping it up with some wrestling. Yeah, I, you know, this weekend, past weekend, was one of those strange weekends where guys go out into some, some of these weird tournaments. This one was called the, the Tiger... Uh, what was it, Mason? The, the, Tiger, the style, Tiger. Tiger Style Invitational, Todd, at Missouri. Thank you, Thank you very much. And, and actually, you know, Missouri is a traditional kind of powerhouse. And, and, and actually, several Terps did pretty well. Uh, Cal Miller took the top spot in the 141-pound weight class, and his brother Ethan finished third at 149. And Cal is a true freshman. Ethan is a redshirt freshman. So that's promising for Maryland. And there were a couple of other uh, big wins by Terps in, in their weight classes. They didn't capture the title, but they finished high in their weight classes. You can tell the folks about some of that. Yeah, Jackson Smith at 197 and Michael North at 157 both finished second in, in their weight classes, as Todd just mentioned. And uh, the Terps also pick up a win by fall of her ninth ranked uh, Zach, is it? Broomingale? Brown Nagel. Brown Nagel. Brown Nagel, I think it is. And he's a, he's a, wrestles for Illinois, and that was part of uh, Jackson Smith's run. And I think he, he lost a close decision in the final to, I think the guy was ranked number six in the country. So um, Smith really showed a lot of promise. And, you know, it's looking good after the, the three dominating wins that Maryland had the previous weekend. Yes, yeah, so Alex Clemson seems like he's got his wrestling program going in the right direction, but the Big Ten, uh, there's no better test in America than the Big Ten with wrestling. Todd, that wraps up the non-rev report. Uh, we're not going to stick with you for football. We, I think I think we brought some bad luck upon our Terps. Um, you know, Mason, I, I thank you for that merciful decision. <laughs> yeah, it was it was a beatdown. Yeah, it it it, it uh, or or as as we as you called it in in our little uh, pre pre-recording chat it was a shit show yes it was and we'll be back in just a moment with more on the turfs uh, 30 nothing loss to penn state todd thanks for joining always a pleasure mason the young turfs are brought to you by DraftKings, and this week on DraftKings, maryland is coming in as a 27 and a half point underdog they are plus 1800 on the money line and uh, Maryland also getting 14 and a half points in the first half. They are 14 and a half point underdog Wayne in the first half at CQ Stadium this week. And maybe it's that close and maybe it's not. It, it, of course, it reminds me of the game that Maryland almost won when we were in the parking lot before that game going. There's no way Maryland's even going to be close. They lose 52 51 in overtime that year. Uh, but man, the, the, Wisconsin game, the Penn State game. I'll, I'll go with some positives. Maryland was really bad in that Wisconsin game. Maryland was awful at Penn State. They lost the first one 23 to 10. They lose the second time, as you all know, 30 to nothing. There have been years where if Maryland was that bad, you would have lost that game 70 to 3 or 63 to 7. Or, so only losing by 30 at Penn State when you're god-awful is actually progress. Hey, and this week, if they keep it within 27 and a half, you take the Terps on the spread, you win two. DraftKings, uh, Larry Hogan today officially releasing a statement saying he hopes the sports betting apps will be live before Thanksgiving. So the timeline's moving up, and you can use our code YOUNGTERPS 
and receive $200 in free bets on launch day after registering five customers will get $1,000 in free bets on launch day. Uh, won't be long before everything becomes legal. You can play same-game parlays, NFL Sundays, PLL odds. DraftKings, the only one with odds on the PLL come summertime. And please play responsibly. For help, visit mdgambling.org or call 1-800-GAMBLER. You must be 21 or older and physically present present in maryland to gamble eligibility restrictions apply subject to regulatory licensing requirements see draftkings.com slash md for full terms and condition one per customer bonuses issued as free bets no purchase necessary for sweepstakes and that ends uh, the day that draftkings launches in maryland which will be around thanksgiving time according to governor hogan this morning overall i think that's good news um betting on maryland uh, your heart and your soul are in it. I'm not sure how much more you can put out there, but 27 and a half sounds about right. The uh, offense has just disappeared. W- what happened to this vaunted Maryland offense? Well, it sounds low to me, given that Maryland lost 30 to nothing to Penn State. Now, if you told me that Maryland was going to have a zero on the scoreboard at the beginning of this year, I just I don't I would have told you that either everybody got hurt which isn't out of the picture when you're talking about Maryland, or that, you know, the team just completely quit. And I, unfortunately, I guess in this case, don't think either of those things happened. I'm not so sure on that, the the quit part. They certainly did not play their best game at Penn State. Uh, One of the issues is that Leah just looks scared. He can't throw the ball downfield. He doesn't step into the throws. And for the most part, he's no threat to run, and everybody plays him that way. And for the life of me, I do not understand why they didn't go to the bench earlier and give Billy Edwards at least a try because nothing good was going on. Had Maryland just gotten a few more first downs, scored once or twice, maybe the balance changes and you really get fired up in a game like that. But the offense gave them nothing, just nothing. So I'm reading back through – Uh, game notes that are in our podcast book from earlier this year. And I I see kind of a recurring theme going back to Charlotte, which is my longest list because we were at that game, is no deep balls, only touchdowns running the ball, interceptions, and um, identity and style is just every every page. Win, loss, indifferent. Those have been the questions throughout the season, and at at this point, they're just, I'm not seeing the path forward. I'm not seeing the the best is ahead mindset is not there, because while I agree with some of the things that you and I have talked about, you know, they lost this game 59-3, to or was it 59-0, that Friday night game, Loxley's first year. They're losing, and they look terrible 30 to nothing now. There's something to be said about that. I think that's really put to the test this week. You know, I, that Wisconsin game was awful. Wisconsin, you know, went up against Iowa and lost the game 24-10. to Played basically the same exact game at, on offense, uh, sans the weather. But Graham Mertz is not good. Wisconsin's offense is, is just not good. But we made them look good. For part of the game, yeah. Well, it's the same problem. You leave the de- defense out there forever, and, and they, they give in. So is Maryland's defense great? No. Are they passable? Sure, but you have to keep the ball half the game. You, you get 35 minutes on offense, 35 minutes of possession, and actually you're effective, your defense looks a lot better. Well, in this era of college football, you can somewhat argue that they actually are good. Scoring defense-wise, they've given up 30 or more points twice this year. Now, given we're playing, or was it three times, Purdue also eclipsed the 30 number they have 32 so michigan yeah michigan purdue and penn state no no team scored more than 40 points against this defense i don't think so the the one you would have given would have been smu but they didn't that night they didn't they They had 27 yeah so to say that the defense just isn't the problem it really isn't no i'm saying they're good enough if you keep the ball for 35 minutes and you're productive, this defense has enough probably to get the job done. But that it just isn't what's going on here. And 
you know, you could say, oh, the offensive line was horrible and maybe the receivers didn't run every route great or whatever else you want to talk about. But, you know, the quarterback was just not at this level. And you start to wonder if he's just hurt, if he's had it mentally, if he's turned into, hate to say this, if he's turned into Jordan Steffi. There was a moment, you know, Ralph loved Jordan Steffi, but at some point you just said Jordan Steffi cannot play at this level. And all those yards and all those touchdowns and all those accolades, when you talk about Leah, you go back and go, well, all the great games that he won. And you go, well, where's that list? Well, there isn't one. The best game he played was the COVID year when they only played five or six games and Maryland wins at Penn State. That's Rock Jarrett's best game. That's Leah's best game. That's it. There's no great win where you go, that guy, that guy got it done. Great win because of that guy. This this isn't a Stan Gelbaugh. It's not a Frank Reich. It's not Broomer Esiason. It's not Scott Milanovic. I mean, there's this whole list of quarterbacks that if the game's being played, you'd rather have that guy out there than Leah. No, and this isn't, you know, really bashing the guy, but look, every TV analyst says, you know, you got to watch this guy. You know, Maryland runs on on Leah. And look, he just he's just not that guy. No. He he's he really not. isn't. And it's almost unfair to say that he is because then you get these expectations that he is, but the game's not there. It just he's just not bringing it right now. And to leave him out there to get his butt whipped and get sacked ten times and do nothing is almost unfair to him. Yeah, I would agree with that. And my list does not fill many stats today as much as I like them. No. You know one thing that's really missing, although this was a little different during the game, when I was having a a fit that they didn't take him out, but not that we lost. Like, eh, they lost. They're not very good. I, I fell for it again. Fool's gold, won a few games early, and I have to leave myself a note on the calendar next year that says give them seven or eight games. Before you say Maryland's any good, just give them seven or eight games because you'll come back and go, nope, not really. And unfortunately, the best Maryland team I've seen in the past 12 years is a Randy Etzel coach team. If you look year over year, they won at Virginia Tech and came back the next year and win at Michigan and they win at Penn State and and actually look like a real team. And since then, not neither. well. They beat a bad Michigan team. They but, beat a yeah, but bad they, Penn State. They team. still won. They still won there. They have never since. Uh, they never won again at Michigan. They've never. No, beat and that's, that's but like that's saying, still the best Maryland team that yeah. we've had for years. But it's like seeing that DJ's team that beat Texas is, you know, they're great wins because they beat brand name programs. But the teams they beat were not better than them. And that's the thing that they've been missing: opportunity after opportunity. Okay. Well, where I was going with that is I'm not really mad. No. Just not that good. There's it's just no- over. Yeah. And, and in a lot of ways, and this is getting far into it, just things have changed. Like, Maryland has 30,000 fans in football games. They have basketball game pictures that look like they should blow that stadium up and go play in Richie Coliseum. And look. We're not immune to that as big fans and as much as we've covered this team. No. Uh, th- just things change. Circumstance changes. And Maryland does really nothing. There's no perk to covering Maryland in the media. They don't say anything. They don't really give you much. So as this is like, you know, we could sit here and do this podcast, and if they were really great, yeah, we would be all over this, but – not as many people are watching this, listening to this show, doing this stuff. It's just... No. And there's not as many media people who cover the team anymore. Yeah, the buy-in as a whole from this community into this team is n- not what it would be if it was a successful Big Ten program. Except for the lacrosse team. People actually still... The same number of people are more show up for lacrosse games. Yeah. And baseball games. So those are two programs on the rise, and people are showing up. But unfortunately, the bellwether sports that make money, eh, no, it's just, it's just not there anymore And, at and I the get moment. to the point where it's just like the game doesn't even start, you know? Oh, the past two games never yeah. started. They were a waste of time. 
that's one of the few Maryland games we've ever had a discussion. You want to go do something else? You want to go to Walmart? But just record the rest of this. They're not winning this game. It just it's the middle of the day. It's a nice day. Find something else to do. And these are people I've gone all over this country following this team. I've missed my friend's wedding. I missed my roommate's wedding because Maryland was playing Penn State that day. I probably would have missed my own funeral to see a Maryland Penn State game. Not only didn't we go, by halftime we're ready to go do something else. It's just they're bad. There's no buy-in towards them. And and you know what? It's a shame because this team's won six games. Vegas had them. DraftKings had them. Five and a half over under win. But the thing about that is, and I brought that up on the show last week. The thing about that is, you know, our friend Ben Page ran a, for the Old Line Tailgating Club, ran a. What, the bus trip at Tailgate? No, no. An over under on on every team you picked over under. Top three best you know, win something, money goes to the tailgating club. I'm almost certain you, uh, you know, as tiebreakers, you have to pick three, three that you're the most confident in. I'm almost certain that everyone's number one was Maryland over five and a half wins. Because that was what this fan base looking at this team told everybody that they were wrong, that we were going to do something this year. But you could still win eight games. It just took the Well, you can still win eight games, but you're playing Ohio State this week. And you're going to lose by 50. 27 and a half. Well, 27 and a half. 27 even. 27 even, according to our friends at DraftKings. So you lose to Ohio State by a lot. You're not winning the game. So even if you get close, you're not winning the game. You beat Rutgers, and you go to an okay bowl game, and you play somebody else who's 6-6. and You win the game, and you won eight games. And it's a massive step forward. It is in the same way that I said that the only – you were god-awful, and you lost by 30. That's – as ridiculous as it is, that's progress because there's better players on this team. But, man, I, it keeps coming back to no matter how good you get within reason, every year you got to play Ohio State, Michigan, Penn State, and Michigan State's good or bad, or Wisconsin, Iowa. I mean, th- these are not pushovers. This is not the ACC, and you have to be really good, really, really good to win in the eastern side of the Big Ten, and we're not. No, we aren't. And and the point is, they're going to change how the scheduling's done. We don't really have that mapped out yet. They're going to change how this is done. But I'm starting to move into that column that says probably never, if this doesn't change, I don't know how Maryland ever really competes in this side of the division. Oh, well, that, that's been a question since the moment they walked into this division. Yes, but I thought they'd find a way. I believed my heart and my soul said we will find a way. I was here. They were great. If Ralph could do it, if Bobby Ross could do it, if Cherry Claiborne could do it, somebody's going to show up here and we're going to do this. And guess what didn't happen? Not yet. I, I can't really see, unless the other programs fall down, I don't see how Maryland moves up. Well, I think you can ask Texas Tech football how you move up for a little bit. Yeah, they did for a little bit. Yeah. They, That's they, all you get. Well, we could have had the Pirate, too. We could have had that, as one might say, mediocre rise, or in this case, meteoric rise, to, to have a couple good seasons. But but that's – it's all BS in a way. I mean, look, you got to find something different, and we're, we're just not that. Uh, we don't have that buy-in, that patience, that future vision leader – in this athletic program so that's going to invest in somebody that's not the same. And I'm not really ready to say that Loxley's the wrong guy. I honestly don't think that – you see, here we are again. We're winning three games a year a handful of years ago, and here we are with six wins. The uh, season's not in the last day, and everybody's angry. They're angry because – But what you don't remember, what everybody is failing to see right now, is the kids that were on that team – that went three and nine are still here. And look, I'm not one because I'm like the same age as them to really attack people personally, but that does count for something. There's a losing mentality in this football program that needs to be removed. And that won't happen for several years. They need to win six 
or seven games year in and year out till somebody in there, and it's not going to be the coach, it's not the strength and conditioning guy, because all those guys clearly, they make millions of dollars to win football games. So you want to see somebody that's motivated to win? I'm pretty sure those guys whose jobs are on the line every single day are pretty motivated to win. What you need is leaders in your locker room that refuse to accept mediocrity and losing. And you know what? Ja'Korian Bennett tried on the sideline. Chop Robinson's out here saying the minute these guys start arguing with each other, it's over. We we already won because he knows. There's a losing mentality about this team. And, yeah, sure, you can blame the coach. It takes a lot. Random times a guy comes in like Jim Mora Jr. is doing at UConn right now, they're going to a bowl. They beat a ranked team. UConn football beat a ranked team on Saturday. But it takes a absolute buy-in and refusal to quit and lose to go from where we were to immediately having a 9-1 season. Right now we're trying to build that, and look, I don't see the leaders in the locker room to build that. I think we got a handful of guys that really buy into this, but everybody outside of that isn't sold on what it really takes to do something. I saw it happen once. Saw it happen with Ralph. I haven't really seen it happen again. Maybe that was the one time I'm ever going to see that. But I, I agree that this is better. And I just, I just am going to have to hang my hat on that this is better. And if somehow this team wins eight games, it still probably should go down as a miracle. And now I'm going to invalidate that I said that with this. I can't see how we're going to have a better collection of talent than your Demas, Rock, Jarrett, Deitches, et cetera, and then you go back, oh, but it still doesn't win. It just isn't elite enough. Well, that's a question that we'll have to figure out. But right now, I see a leading receiver that has less than 400 yards. Which is Rakim. Yep. Demas, who's just not not the Dante Demas that existed last year. I think he has 105 yards on the on the year. Yeah. So I, I, I'm a, a dying quarter- on these press clippings. Yeah, a quarterback yeah. that seemingly has regressed year <sighs> over year. Seemingly has well, regressed. I mean, yeah, uh, you look the guy at the can't tape, play. The guy, the guy is n- not in the best mindset at the moment is really what it looks like. A defense has actually gotten better, but has a lot of guys that are in their fifth or sixth year at the program. And look, it is what it is, but I see a guy at TCU that I played lacrosse against my senior year of high school. Yeah, I remember that this had guy. It, that hadn't played football or played one year at Navy, and he's the leading tackler of the number four team in the country. Yeah. I wondered. I looked at 57. I said, I think I know that guy. Yeah. A- and that's was a lacrosse player from? Quince Orchard. Yeah. yeah. Here in Montgomery County. Yep. So, I mean, things change. You find talent in different places, and that's something that this – this program's done very, very well, but look, it's going to take finding a generational talent at either, I mean, it's really a handful of positions, like Kenneth Walker for Michigan State last year. It's like the best guy they're going to have in Michigan State in a long time. Maryland's got to go find that guy, have a decent, basically have the team they have right now, and add that one guy in a position where you can give them the ball every single play, and that's it. They need, like, Lamont Jordan to walk through the door. They need Lamont Jordan. They need E.J. Henderson to show up. Yeah. E.J. Henderson on one side is a middle linebacker and a, a bell cow on offense, whether it's your quarterback or your tailback, and say that's the guy. And, and that's something that you and I had that conversation earlier this year. They're like one edge rusher, like game-changing player yeah. on what we thought was defense, but it really seems like on offense. And, and by the way, it's not Chop Robinson. It's not your game. They lost the guy, but he's not your game-changing player. The he guy's got three sacks this year. Yeah. Everybody needs to calm the hell down. Yeah, it's not that guy. And two of them came against us in yeah. a game that was just shot. But All right, so we giving up, or are we going back out there against Ohio State? Well, I think the whole team has to ask themselves that question. Is, is this over? Well, th- that was the rest of my rant. Thank you. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to steal your stuff again. That has to be. Uh, I got three things that go down past the game here. One of them's coaching. The other one's expectation. The other one is Tebow with a question mark. Now, what I would do is that. You know, Loxley said everybody needs to take a long look in the mirror, and that starts with me. 
which I feel like is 100% the right thing to say, not, not only to the media, but to your own players, is we all need to make a decision here. If you want to leave, it's another one of these. You want to leave, there's the door. You want to transfer somewhere, you think that you're going to make it somewhere, go ahead, kind of be my guest kind of thing. But I'll tell you one thing, sure as hell ain't quitting on my watch. That that's what it that's what it was. Because we went to Wisconsin and we lost. You know, it was ugly. We really lost the game twenty three to three, but the score in the end of the scoreboard is twenty three to ten and that's what counts. Then I don't know what the hell happened this week. But this time, again, opportunity is every week in this league. And you can you have the opportunity to come out here and do something great. Now, we can either take advantage of that or we can collectively quit. But I think that they have enough guys, again, going back to leadership in the locker room, do we have enough guys? Have we built up enough men to move on starting really today? We're recording the show Monday night. Today, to go out there on the practice field and bring it, to prepare to win. That's the other thing. Your expectation and I have this conversation with Jordan, who's actually in sports at college level, the expectation has to be to win. You cannot make up mindset in people if you don't believe yourself that you can win week in, week out. Compete. Do your job correct, and then hope that your teammates will bring it with them. No one man is going to win us a game. It's football. They call it the greatest team sport because it takes everybody. If you don't have everybody, you will lose. And I think that's where this team is. They got some guys, and that's why it's better. But not everybody is bought in. So as a unit together, the mindset is still weak. And unfortunately, there's really three positions they talk about in football where the mindset has got to be extremely strong. And offensive center, we don't have right now. Quarterback, mindset-wise, we don't have right now. And inside linebacker on defense as a real leader, we don't have right now. We do have the Reapers on the back line. Those safeties and, and really And they're bring great, it. and they can call this defense. But traditionally, teams that are great have great players at those three positions. They have true leaders at those three positions, and the great skill guys come around them. And right now, I see us lacking at all three of them. We took a guard and made him the center, and they should have never changed that. You can rotate linemen, but your center is the leader of the offense. That Mar- guy's got to stay on the field. Maryland's playing three centers right now. And that is a – there's a handful of things that I see in football games every week. Like, Oregon got away with it. Or, no, they didn't because they lost. They try to kick an onside kick in the second quarter. And you're like, that's just a losing play. Well, that's AC Payday's losing play of the week is the inopportune onside kick. Or fake punt or – you know, there's just this handful of plays. To me, rotating offensive linemen are, is a losing mindset. Now, we do it under the guise of player development, and it is important. You're playing SMU, and we're winning by 14. Sure, rotate a guy in that you think's got a bright flush. We're pl- Charlotte. We're playing Charlotte. Send everybody that we got out there. Howard. If, they, if we could invent a, a program named Sheldon, we'd play Sheldon and Howard and Charlotte, and we beat those people, and you can play all 85 guys. But not when but it's a real we're game. we're in Big Ten football, mid-drive, and we're rotating guys. That, I don't understand I, I that. Don't makes you question that. everything we're doing. I was a big Braswell fan, big, big time, believe that they need some sort of consistency in that position group coaching because, let's face it, we've had like seven coaches in ten years on the offensive line. That's another losing formula. Okay. So you, you have a, a rant in the book. What, what was the – Well, that was most of it. Well, let's get to the actual coaching part then. Well, that, that was the start of it. We're rotating guys in there, and as a coach, I have personally played and coached games that are as embarrassing as this, where the expectation was much higher, and it was lacrosse, and we lost like 18-3. to three. And you're like, everyone's looking at each other like, who the hell's going to do something to stop this kind of thing? And at that moment, those are the moments that define you in coaching. And there's a guy like like a Ryan Day is a great example. He's never really had that moment. Well, there are a few times that that team's been punched in the face and they've had to respond. And in those moments, they've lost. Mainly the college football playoff games, Michigan game last year. The, the Penn State, they were down. They punched back and they won. You see, he's, he's getting there, but it takes a handful of those times. Our response to these things 
it's just awful. I, I mean, it, it is, you watch the coaches on the sideline when we start getting our shit kicked in, to use the words that they probably would use, and what what are we doing? Loxley's walking up and down the sideline screaming at people. Our offensive coordinator's in the booth, isn't he? I'd get as far away from that as yeah, I, I could I, as I well. Would too. Yeah. <laughs> I would have left. I, I, I wouldn't, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it seems like Mike Miller, who I think is a fantastic coach. Tight ends coach. Yeah, passing game coordinator. Well, not I guess not really. He's not a play caller, but they call him a coordinator of some sort, which doesn't make any sense to me. He continues to coach. Yeah. Billy Edwards' brother, the quarterback's brother, continues to coach. Yeah. See him he, out there. He continues to coach, but it seems like as a whole, when they start losing, they, they like just – they just fall apart. They look like they've never seen a football game before. They've never seen adversity that they've actually overcome. And it doesn't matter if it's in football or someplace else. Somebody's got to say, it's on me. We're going to fix this, and we're going to do it now, which is what Ja'Cory and Bennett tried to do. And where is that response? You know, I talked about player-led leadership earlier. During the game, That's a lot of that's off the field. And it's during the game, but it is the, the mindset of, when people get frustrated and they quit, their teammates have to pull them up. Coaches, you try not to get involved with that that much. That's a that's a teammate. That's why you want a leadership aspect of your seniors generally. But when the game starts going wrong and you are all there to do one thing, which is put your players in positions to win, you have got to almost turn around and he tries with Leah. But at this point, I think Loxley knows it too. Leah doesn't really respond. Like, in the game, he cannot respond. No. If it, if the play isn't where he thinks it is, it just gets ugly fast. So as a coach, what, I guess, is their philosophy or what is their mindset on how to stop disaster? Because what I see week in and week out now, and it probably will happen for a third time on Saturday, is we don't have any plays that are different. We don't have opportunities to get the ball to our playmakers. We don't have a set list of plays that we're like, we know our guys know how to run these 10 plays. Yeah. We're going to call these 10 plays until either they stop it or till we can settle ourselves down into the game. I agree. They had it last year. They ran a great RPO look last year where they had a slant pass going over the middle and a deep ball going out on the other side. A really, really just great football design play. Every time we try and run it this year, our quarterback is no threat to run. Those plays don't work. So you got to go find something else or play somebody else. You got to play. I, I, I'll go with you have to play somebody else. I would I, too. I'm going to jump on that train as we get a little late in the show here, which is you also have to know at this point which 11 guys belong on the field when the thing starts going wrong. And I do do not understand how you end up playing four running backs, how you end up playing ten wide receivers. You, and I've said this before, and it, it pains me because I desperately want to win these games. Who are the 11 best guys you have when the game's on the line? Stick your 11 best guys out there and well, go with this. That is a coaching thing. That is 100% a coaching thing. Look, I've said this before, and I will say it again right now. If you're afraid of guys transferring, if we win, you know what? Screw them. If we're winning games here, now what, what do these guys come here to do? Win and make it to the NFL. A lot of them. Now we're actually talking about that because we've been recruiting at that level. They want to win here, and then they want to make it a career out of football in some, some aspect. When you're a true freshman, the expectation cannot be to play. If the expectation is we're going to bring in freshmen, specifically freshman linemen, and they're going to play, we've already lost. That's not how you win in this league. Sure, if we have a wide receiver, you, what you can do is you can sit down with that guy and say, look, when we're beating somebody 52-7, to you'll get some reps this year. If guys get hurt, we have full confidence in your ability to play the game. What I will not say is when we need to win conference games and you've been good in practice, if you've been absolutely fantastic, yeah, we'll play you. If you're the best guy, we will play you. But you have to beat the other three or four guys. But we... And this is a belief that they have said on film and in press conferences throughout this year. If we honestly believe we have six NFL-level wide receivers and tight ends, 
you can't play freshmen. You're really telling me that these guys are better than Octavian Smith, who's running the ball out from five yards deep in the end zone, which I agree with you, something that we've discussed. That's a play. They're asking him to do that because they know they have nothing on offense. He can't be put in that position. We don't have a guy that puts there. Let the ball go in the end zone every time. But they have it on defense. When they need to make a stop, the 11 best guys are on the field. Yes, they do. On offense, uh, I'm just – it's the whole entire season – has looked like a bunch of guys, and I can't believe it because these guys were coaching at Alabama. Talk about a place that doesn't have talent. Yeah. They find a way to get their best damn 11 guys on the field, and they win the championship. Our commitment to success this season has been, it almost seems lackluster, non-existent, stupid. I don't know. They come in. I've called it a pitch count. I've called it a diner menu of offense. They got every flavor you got, but you don't know what kind of restaurant you're eating in. But and even at the diner, when you walk in the diner, you got like five things that every single one has, oh, and those five will be there. I know what I'm going to order. That's yeah. the problem. They don't know what they're going to order. They just don't know. No, they go to the diner and they order the T-bone. They go to the diner, they order one from every column and hope the food's okay. That's not the way to do this. The other thing is I believe that there's a pitch count behind this, that they actually are seeing and going, well, Ramon Brown has to get eight plays today. Why? Shalik Knox needs to run six routes today. Why? Is he is he better than Rakim Jarrett? Probably not. And I don't mean to pick on anybody in particular. It's just the players. I mean, what in the world is that kid doing in the game at this point? And I don't know. I, I really don't. And I know the answer. The coaching answer is that's who we decided to play. That's the best. That's who we believe is the best player at the time. Okay, fine. So that that's where we are on this. Um, it, it's just mismanagement. It is just a shame. It is. It is. Eight wins, and it's all fixable, and you hope that they can keep the staff together and a lot of the kids come back so you can build some consistency. You're probably not beating Ohio State. But, yes, I want my players thinking we are. And you got to go beat Rutgers. And you even at that you point. You have to win you, the bowl game. you got to win the bowl game. You really you do. You have to win the bowl game. I just, as, as we're kind of winding it down, I don't even know how Rakim is the NFL talent that he said he was or that everyone said he was at this point. They have given him a lack of plays on the field through his time here that, they gave the I, ball to Diggs more, and Diggs didn't get the ball enough, and they gave him the ball more, and they're giving this guy. I mean, it guy. feels like every one of these guys is Dion Long, because clearly you could see when Dion Long got the ball, you were like, what the hell? Where's this guy been? I think that of Copeland. I think Copeland is absolutely well, he's, underused. Now he's dropped like four passes in a row that probably could have changed some of these games. And look, I, But I agree with you in that way. Every one of them. Where's Jayshon Jones? Has Jayshon Jones caught a pass the last three games? Man, that guy plays hard. That's the, one of the best blocking wide receivers. That guy's going to make it. As a special he, teams guy in the NFL. He's going to make it. Rakim's going to make it. Copeland's going to make it. Deitches is going to make it. Dupree's going to make it. I don't know about these running backs. And probably one or two of these offensive linemen is going to be in a roster five years from now, and you're going to turn around and look back like we're talking about the Turgeon basketball teams that had <laughs> Wiggins, Herder, Fernando, Marcel, it's and these guys are playing the NBA, but they couldn't win more than 17 games at Maryland. They couldn't win. They couldn't get to a Sweet 16 at Maryland with four or five guys that are playing the NBA. And you're gonna look at this football team and say, my God, on that day that we lost 30 to nothing, six of these guys are in the NFL. Skill position and linemen, and that's the thing that will get you, because we scored zero points this week. Zero. Didn't even come close. Not once? No. <laughs> I think we made over the 50 twice the entire game. Maybe and once in was this, running the locker room. In this era of football, <laughs> scoring zero points is unheard of. Could have had the Pirate. We could have had the Pirate. It could have had anybody. I mean, give me Scotty Montgomery back up there in the booth. We'll do better than scoring zero. All right. I mean. Who's the guy? at? Uh, at some point, yeah. you just have to say, you know what, Enos, if you're still calling the plays, I'm calling the plays now. I've had it. We can score. Two weeks, we have 10 points. 
I saw a stat that Barstool tweeted out today that said Maryland's been outscored like 839 to 177 against Penn State or something ridiculous like that. Well, if you take Penn State, Michigan, Ohio State, I I would agree with that. It's it's ridiculous. But, hey, opportunity. Hey, this is still who we love. Problem is we're still in love. Uh, it, it the doesn't... problem is I'm still going to the damn game on we're, Saturday. Of course we are. We're not missing the game. Who's missing? No, we're going to the game. I'd like you to go in there and get these guys fired up on Saturday because hey, you're not keep... backing. You might lose 100 or nothing, but you're not backing down. <laughs> no, not at all. People keep tw- um, posting comments on our YouTube and in various places where we post this saying that. I should give the speech before the game, but I'd give the that, speech. You know I might get arrested for giving the speech, but I'd give the darn speech. S- somebody has to, because I don't think it's happening right now. Um, I still believe. I still have pride in this place. Everything has gone wrong. This place can win, and I'm not crazy for thinking it. But I'm starting to wonder if I was a little crazy for thinking it. When you actually look at it rationally, you know, I don't know how this is going to happen. But I hate to say, an hour into this show, yeah, I still believe. Uh, it, it, yeah. I, I will believe till I die. I am a Maryland Terrapin. Well, we need more people like that around. I'm uh, on a different note. I'm on the actual game that's coming up, not the game that's passed. I'm actually kind of looking forward to seeing this Ohio State team up and close from the field. Marvin Harrison Jr. has been fantastic this year. I don't really believe in C.J. Stroud too no, much. No, I don't either. But he gets bailed out by those wide receivers. He has he has the the guts and the faith to throw the ball towards the receiver and those receivers make plays for him yeah he might not be the most accurate guy uh did you see the end of the bills and the vikings uh, i saw it up until the point where josh allen dropped the ball in the end zone something that i've been waiting to happen to one of the teams that i root for that's been stopped on the goal line with like no time yeah. left i would actually say that the the last two minutes of that game plus that overtime and the Bills game versus the Chiefs in the playoffs last year was absolutely the best football I have seen in this era. You, you stitch those four minutes a game together, or ten minutes, that's the highest level that I've seen. The plays that were made, the athletes that are out there, it's just incredible. And on that note, so does Maryland come close to that 27.5? I do not think so. When the times have gotten rough, we pack it in and head for the hills. And unfortunately, it happened when DJ, who I think is a completely different voice, was here. It really didn't happen when Randy was here. Matt Canada had an okay run of it. Matt Canada did have an okay run of it, but it certainly happens when Mike Loxley is the coach. And that doesn't really stop. I got it. Ohio State 66, Maryland 10. I had 63 to 7 because there's been a lot of 63 to 3, 63 hey, to 10. They beat us last year 73 to 10, I think, or something like that. I watched the whole game. I just choose not to remember it. Uh, we will be there, rain or shine, win or lose, to the last. What is the weather looking like? It's supposed to be a, a little colder than it has been. And then we've got Rutgers on Thanksgiving weekend. There should be tens of people out there. Yeah, high of 40, low of 26, sunny on Saturday. We'll be there. Yes, we will. Cameras clicking away. Yep, and all of the coverage. More we'll- rants like this can be found <laughs> on the Big Dog Post Game Show, live from CQ Stadium. In College Park, Maryland. And, of course, this we're live in the Viner Four Gate studio. And as we, we wrap it up here, brought to you by Viner Four Gates. Your Terrapin source for IT needs and security and phone systems and all the things that you need to run your business. You can give Viner Four Gates a call in the D.C. metro area at 301-251-2900 or nationally at 877-797-8776. Check us out on the web. We appreciate all the web tra- traffic we have been getting at oneviner.com. Mason? Take us home. Man, you can also find unsolicited college football coaching uh, advice at, from Viner Four Gates. Uh, absolutely, you may. And, well, wrapping it up, we'll be out there, like we just said four times over, at CQ Stadium this weekend. If you see us in the parking lot or in the stadium, stop by and say hi. 
217 episodes in, not much changes when you're talking about the Terps. But hey, I guess it's finally time for us to start kicking off our basketball coverage on the podcast in the upcoming weeks as things get serious with the Terps in the Kevin Willard era. And as always, oh, 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 before you do that, please check out the event that we're going to have with the Babe Ruth Museum. Yeah, got a cool event coming up. Um, this is it on the 1st? December 1st in Catonsville. Yeah, at Rolling Road Country Club, uh, Kathy Reese and John Tillman. Two coaches that know how to win something. Boy, don't we'll they. We'll sit down with uh, she and Stan with Birch right. and Mark Dixon. So two of the best voices in lacrosse, two of the best coaches in lacrosse. Uh, up close and personal was a great event when we had Brenda Fries and Kevin Willard. It supports one of the only museums that maintains the history of sports in this great state of Maryland, the Babe Ruth Museum. Tickets can be found on that on the Babe Ruth Museum website. I'll put a link in the description of this podcast. Uh, Wayne, Bruce, myself will be out there as Viner Forgates and the big dog himself, Rick Jackledge, sponsor that event for the Babe Ruth Museum. So looking forward to that on December 1st. And now... As always, thanks for listening.